is just because it has not been done before doesn't mean it cannot be done or it cannot ever be changed. One of the biggest lies in our society is that things can't change. But the reality is that's based on a mindset about a thing. If we look at throughout history, we can see clearly people that have impacted industry were folks who just thought, what if we went about this differently? What if we went about this a new way? What if we approach this issue in a diff completely different approach? And those individuals became beneficiaries because they actually took a median that was pushing the envelope. Hi, everybody. Lee Scott here. Thank you for watching and or listening to this week's episode of Leading with Lee, where we talk about life, leadership, and legacy. And we want to help you discover the leadership within. If you have not done it yet, go on YouTube and all podcasting platforms and subscribe today. I'm so excited that you are here because this episode of Leading is near and dear to my heart because it's something that affects a place that I love profoundly, and that is my hometown of Jackson, Mississippi. And today I'm going to talk about Jackson and I want to kind of give some framing around this conversation. But my subject today is going to be called can we can it be done rather? Excuse me. Can it be done? And I'm going to talk about what has been happening in our community. So as you probably know, if you are someone who has been paying attention to the news or anything that's been going on particularly here in the state of Mississippi, you would notice that back in August, Jackson experienced something that was unprecedented. Um, Jackson experienced something that has happened before, but it is so pervasive in our society and culture right now that we have experienced a flood again. And it became national news. And as many of you know, uh, this was what caused this flooding was the Pearl River, which is uh, located between kind of two or three cities within the Jackson Metro area ended up flooding and it overran and the crest rose really high and it caused the thing to flood and go over the dams and flood into our city. Well, quite frankly, here in Jackson, our water treatment plant, which is OB Curtis uh, water treatment plant is located near this place. And because of this flooding, we saw uh, our system become overwhelmed. It flooded into OB Curtis and caused one of the main water pumps to break. This situation literally led to thousands upon thousands of Jacksonians not having access to clean drinking water and even just water to bathe themselves. Depending on where you lived in the city, you might have experienced some uh, tr truly, truly difficult things. And uh, in some cases, there were people that had low or just no pressure at all. And this is something that was really, really significant. As I said earlier, it was all over national news networks. And there were so many conversations about what was happening in Jackson. But this is not the only time in my city's history that something like this, like water, has been at the center of a crisis. Back in 1979, um, there was a flood that was, there was a situation that happened in 1979 on, on April 11th and 12th, and it was called, nicknamed rather, the, the Easter flood. It happened over Easter weekend. And in 1979, this, this flood uh, was a result of over those two days, April 11th and 12th, the city and the area got about between 15 and 20 inches of rain, which was very, very shocking for that time. This situation caused uh, thousands of Jacksonians to have to evacuate their homes. There are many businesses and nonprofit, there have been businesses and organizations and streets and, and different things that were overran with water. Um, I'm going to, it was quite evident when I was looking and doing some research about this, that you could literally only see the top of people's houses. It was just that devastating. And it's wild to think about that and, and recognize that even the Mississippi Coliseum was flooded. And so this situation was so detrimental 
to our city's future. And I even read an article uh, where a former mayor of Jackson talked about even he said, even in that time, that it's a possibility that that situation possibly could happen again. And he said this back in the ni- late 1970s, 19, early 1980s. And we have seen how this situation just didn't stop there. Back in 2019, Jackson experienced a flash flood, which caused our city to see water rushing through parts of our city that's quite unusually gets that type of water flow. And it caused some damage to the water system back in 2019. I and mean, we saw last year in 2021 how we had an ice storm that we were not prepared for. And being a southern state, we generally don't have uh, our systems weatherized in a particular way. We generally don't have our uh, systems set up a particular way because we it is not that often that we get uh, inclement weather that is unprecedented. But those this situation caused nearly 43,000 folks in Jackson to lose access to water and even pipes burst throughout the city. And we know that this is an infrastructure conversation. and This is something that is ongoing. But I, today I kind of want to center this conversation and talk about it because, quite frankly, it is not a new thing that Jackson is facing, but it is something that we can make some reasonable, wise decisions about and actually change the narrative for our future if we actually prioritize and put into focus this idea. So today I'm going to talk about these four things. Now, I'm going to be very clear. I'm not going to address any of the conversations that you might see in media or news or anything like that. Um, If you want to find out what the conversations that are happening um, among our leaders, particularly our elected leaders, you can go read about it. You can go watch uh, news reports, you can go watch press conferences, all that information is out there. So you can do that to find out what's happening. But I'm going to speak about it from a leadership perspective and kind of really center this idea of us looking at it in a new and profound way. Because I really believe that we are at a critical mass moment and we can, if we work together, make a change in the difference in Jackson's future when we actually center some of these ideas. So here's the first thing that I want to talk about today, because I believe that this is a huge part of the answer. Well, one thing that we can do in order for us to move forward is we must center innovation. We must center innovation. Obviously, as I just said, we are seeing that these are conversations that are being had among leaders that can really affect the issue. But I can tell you that I I hope and suspect that they're starting to have broader conversations about what is possible. Now, we always it's always important to look at what has been done before and consider the cost. Right. And consider what is possible and what what is necessary. But it is important for us to keep in context what it's going to take to do it. As I spoke to earlier about the flood of 1979, they had estimated at that time that it was going to be worth a half a billion dollars to fix it. And now it is equivalent to a billion dollars to fix that problem of that flood that happened nearly happened over 50 years ago. Now it's been 52 years or excuse me, 53 years since that flood happened. And we have seen how over time this pervasive issue has stayed with our city. And I really, really want to t- bring up the fact that now there's, like I said, there's so many things that are happening but we have to be unconventional in our thought process about what is can be done and, and actually think about what is a new way that we can approach this issue. Maybe we, we may not need to do this particular thing, or maybe we may not need to do this other particular thing. And maybe we need to consider some other resources. These are things that have to come up in conversations because in order for us to move in a new and more productive way, we have to be innovative in our conversations about what is possible. I was having a conversation just recently with uh, a board member for the organization that I work for, the nonprofit that I work for. And we were talking specifically about uh, this company, Intel, which is a, a, a mass producing company that uh, create, does a lot of computer programming and creates a lot of technology within our country. And he was sharing with me that, that about a gentleman who was an alumni of Mississippi State University 
who actually approached Intel and had been was an engineer and he ended up working with the company. And he noticed that they weren't able to preserve their chips in their computers for a long period of time. And he went to them and he said, hey, I just created this, this casing that would protect the technology. It won't prevent the technology from working really well. It, it won't stop the technology from being effective. It just will encase it so that it can last longer. Well, this one small innovation, this one small thoughtful idea created an opportunity for this gentleman was able to get an exclusive contract with Intel and become a multimillionaire very quickly. That this idea that someone came up with a with one strategy, one just small intention, one change of narrative, one idea that was effective, it is, is a way for us to realize that we can all participate in making a difference in any space that we're in. And this one man took that on. He actually did something that was profound and really it caused the company to make a whole lot of money because they weren't, they didn't have to produce more things in the process. They were able to save some, some cash on hand, but able to get people to be more committed to their product. And maybe you are listening to this and watching this and you're saying to yourself, Lee, I, I may not be like the Intel guy. I may not do something that great. And you're saying to yourself, how can I create something like that or cause that to happen? And I want to tell you, it's important for you to understand that all of us have the ability to transform whatever thing we are a part of. And one thing I want to say that I think is, is truly important is just because it has not been done before doesn't mean it cannot be done or it cannot ever be changed. One of the biggest lies in our society is that things can't change. But the reality is that's based on a mindset about a thing. If we look at throughout history, we can see clearly people that have impacted industry were folks who just thought, what if we went about this differently? What if we went about this a new way? What if we approach this issue in a com diff completely different approach? And those individuals became beneficiaries because they actually took a median that was pushing the envelope. Even right now, as you're watching me or listening to me right now, you are experiencing me in a new median about 20 years ago, 20, 25 years ago. Podcasting has not been around very, very long or vlogging has not been around very, very long. But somebody had an idea and said, hey, what if we digitized this median? What if we created more ways of access with this median? What if we created a space where people if they didn't want to listen to the radio, because there were radio shows that were doing this, what if we created a space where people could listen to it on their phones? What if we created a space where people could listen to it on their computer or in their cars or, or engage content this way? That one innovation has literally created a whole industry and it's worth billions of dollars. What is that for you when we talk about this conversation of innovation? It is that you have to understand that you and I have the capacity and the ability to be answers. And in the way that we the way that we are able to be answers is by thinking a little bit further than what's already been done. You and I can do that. You can do that on your job. You can take an idea from here and take an idea from there and bring them together or look at something that's unique in this space and look at something that's unique in this space and bring those things together in order for you to do something successful in the world. I, I, I give you a great story of this. Uh, during World War II, there was this gentleman, and I'm going to talk a little bit about World War II even later, but, but there was this gentleman, his name was Henry Kaiser, and Henry Kaiser was approached by the United States government to build a, a, a vast number of ships. Henry Kaiser, uh, he's considered the father of modern shipbuilding. And, and Henry Kaiser ended up uh, uh, doing this phenomenal thing. And uh, what, what was so amazing is he was trying to figure out how to build ships. He wasn't a shipbuilder. He, he had not done it for a number of years. He was relatively new to the, the industry, but he was given a mandate by President Rose, uh, to, excuse me, uh, uh, 
uh, FDR, which is a Franklin Delano Roosevelt, he was going to mandate to build these ships. And so what he did was he went and had a conversation with Henry Ford. And Henry Ford is considered the father of the assembly line. He he was so so brilliant in how he built cars and mass produced cars that he talked to Henry Kaiser and he said he gave him the idea of using that same philosophy in building ships. And at the time they were building one ship, if I'm not mistaken, and, and, and you can go do your research. At the time, they were trying to build a bunch of ships in a very short period of time. And he was getting like one ship every three to six months. But during the war, they needed ships much, quick, much quicker. He figured out this. He basically applied the process that was given to him by Henry Ford. And by his wisdom and by his understanding or taking the innovation that Henry Ford had taken or created in his space, he brought it to his space and was able to mass reduce very quickly. It is not about reinventing the wheel. It's just learning how to take ideas that are effective and that can work and bringing them into a space where you can actually capitalize on what is being done. That is a powerful thing about innovation. That is the powerful thing about creating new ideas or creating new pathways or making a difference in the world. It is strictly about your ability to see something in another space and say, how can this apply in this one? And this is what Henry Kaiser did. This is what other individuals have done. They have taken those ideas. They've taken the things that they've, that's been revealed to them and brought it into another space. Here's the second thing that we want to talk about today. The second thing is collaboration is critical. Now, I know that there will be tons of information and conversations about this issue but but I'm I'm saying I'm telling you it is powerful and I just made reference to the documentary that I was watching it was called uh, the Titans who built America and it really focuses on America in the time between 1919 and 1945 as as we will know between that time it was the end of World War 1 and America went into this economic boom where you saw the, the, it was called the Roaring Twenties. We know uh, during that time, there was a mass wealth that was created and a mass of wealth that was uh, uh, able to be obtained by certain individuals in our country. And then we know at the end of the decade, we had one of, one of the most uh, unprecedented things to happen with the Great Depression. And the president came to power as a result of the crash of the stock market in 1929 and the the years that followed was, as I said, talked about him earlier, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And Roosevelt was very, very, very aggressive when it came down to trying to bring millions of Americans into the fold of economic prosperity and growth. And he was very hard on very wealthy, big business folks who he saw as adversaries. And in this documentary, I mentioned one gentleman, but there are other people that, that were a part of the conversation. They had individuals who were industrialists like Pierre DuPont. Pierre DuPont was uh, the president of General Motors at the time. And he's the reason why we have the Empire State Building in New York City. And not only that, that DuPont was significant in that sense, but DuPont also uh, had a chemical company that became very critical during World War II. There's other individuals like, as I said, Henry Ford, who was the father of the assembly line and is, is a profound uh, impactor and, and innovator within the automobile industry. And it talks about J.P. Morgan Jr., who was the financier of a lot of huge projects in America. And it even talks about William Boeing, who we know of Boeing planes. Probably every plane that has been made in the world today has Boeing's name on it at some point or is a type of Boeing plane. And these men had a mass significant amount of wealth. They had a mass significant amount of, of, of uh, things in order for them to build their own lives and build their own fortunes. And that became a problem, as I said, for President Roosevelt. And President Roosevelt started to put out policies that would require them to pay more taxes, to 
take care of folks in our country, in our culture. And the American people love him for it. And they became very adversarial towards him. And the documentary even talks about how they really supported uh, uh, Roosevelt to find out that he would be their biggest, biggest opponent. But something changed in the 1940s. As many of us understand and know, we we know about Pearl Harbor. In school, we were taught about Pearl Harbor, how uh, the Japanese who were a part of the Axis powers at the time attacked a island, one of the islands in Hawaii. It was one of the bases that the United States had at the time. And this attack led to President Roosevelt engaging his biggest enemies in trying to fight against not only the Japanese specifically, but the folks who were aligned with the Nazis. And there was two things happening around the world and it caused all these men who did not like each other, even among the industrialists that I was speaking about, they did not, many of these men were competitors. They weren't quite fond of each other. Uh, Pierre DuPont was trying to outdo uh, people like Walter Chrysler and Henry Ford. They wanted to sell more cars. And in turn, they became allies and friends and began to work together to ensure that America was in a better position. What am I talking about when I talk about how collaboration is critical? Sometimes in our lives, we are pushed into collaboration when we have moments of crisis and moments of fear. And we can see it happening in our happen here in the city of Jackson how the pump was able to get fixed because it was a moment of crisis. People who had different ideas and different views of the world end up working together in that regard. And I think that it's important for us to note that in order for us to get anything done in our lives, we got to recognize that collaboration is a key. It is a strategy. It is something that we can use to our advantage. And it's not working against us. It's something that we can actually uh, develop and grow in and 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 actually put pressure on systems to change and do something different. And let me be quite frank with you. You don't necessarily have to like people to work with them. Now, I know there are going to be people that listen to this and they're going to be like, well, Lee, I, I can't agree with you on that. I, but I don't think anybody who's been successful in business or successful at anything always like the people that they work with. Because the reality is in order for you to be successful, you have to be able to engage different kinds of people, engage different kinds of individuals, engage people with different personalities in order to get the job done because they may have the answer that you need. They may have access in the way that you need. They may have the, 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 the key that you need in order for you to move forward in a way that you want to move forward. So, so, so Lee, what, what is that going to require me? You might be saying, you might say, Lee, how, how do I overcome that? Well, what you have to do is realize that you can take what they say and take the wisdom that they have and understand it and use it to your advantage. You may not like anything that, in which they operate in, but sometimes the greatest piece of wisdom can come from the most unlikely places. And so, Learn to operate with a level of humility and also a, with a level of openness that allows you to hear people that you generally wouldn't listen to. And it doesn't mean you have to change your position about them. The fact of the matter is, is to accomplish the bigger or greater goal, you have to be willing to collaborate with any and everybody that are willing to engage in the process. And that's a key in order for us to move forward in our lives and make a difference in the world around us. Right now, as I'm speaking right now, there are people that are probably having conversations that don't like each other. They're probably individuals that are, that are not that fond of each other, that are engaging in conversations about what is possible in our city and in our communities, but we need them to have those conversations. Because when they have those conversations, it creates opportunities for folks to get the answers that they need. And my, my question for you today and my encouragement to you is, can you actually get beyond yourself, beyond how you feel about an individual and try to glean and learn? And I'm telling you, there's so many times that in my life where I've been challenged to glean from people I wasn't a big fan of. 
to learn from people I wasn't a big fan of, to actually grow and get access because those situations actually made me a better person. And, and, and I'm telling you, I, I, I have experienced many moments where I wasn't that engaged or that happy about it coming from that person. <laughs> but I got the answer that I needed. I got the perspective that I needed. I got the resources that I needed because I was willing to operate with a level of humility. And one thing we know about people is that when they see that you are willing to listen to them, they will tell you anything because you're giving them the space to be honest, authentic, and be themselves. We're going to take a break for this moment, and we'll be right back after this message. Hi, everybody. Lee here, and I want to give some information to you. Do you need someone to host an event or come and speak at your event? You can now book yours truly. Book me for your event by visiting www.leascott.com. I am so excited to connect with you and do work with you. Much love, and let's get started. And we are back. Thank you for still being here. And I hope that you've been been inspired by the first two points that I've shared with you about understanding that innovation is necessary for all of us. But we also have to recognize that collaboration is a key to our success. So let's move on a little bit and, and talk about these final two points, because I think those these are some things that are super encouraging for you. And you may not even know this, um, whether you're here in Jackson or you're outside of the city of Jackson and have been watching from around the world or around the area, you may have wondered what has been happening on the ground. And just so happened, I work for an organization called Jackson Leadership Foundation, which I've mentioned on here before. And I am the volunteer recruitment coordinator for the organization. And I can tell you this third point has been quite evident in the work that we've been doing, but other organizations across our city has been doing. And that is this, number three, stepping up is necessary. When I tell you, I, like never before, it was really encouraging to see folks, churches, civic organizations, schools, different entities across our city and across our communities, folks were stepping up to the plate and saying, hey, how can I help? And people were doing it around their work schedules. People were, were staying out late. People were, 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 were taking time off of work. People like we were, we actually uh, as an organization got out in our cars and drove and took water to folks who were elderly and disabled and were shut in and could not get to a place to actually get water. Uh, there, there are hundreds of folks who had cars who would let other people ride with them to go get water for family members and individuals who needed water. There, there were FEMA and MEMA and all these organizations across our, our, sta our state and national emergency organizations were giving information and disseminate information to folks to step up and give them opportunities to participate in serving and helping folks. Uh, I saw church leaders come to us. I saw a nonprofit, even Jackson Public Schools got a lot of help in some ways, and they still uh, could use some folks supporting them in some ways, but, but people begin to step up. People get, begin to make it their mission that, hey, we know that it's going to be always be narratives that are built around what we are doing here in Jackson, but we care and know more about our city because we are here. We're going to do everything in our power to ensure that folks, no matter where they live in our city, no matter where they are, they're getting what they need. And my question for you, and, and not just my question, but my encouragement to you rather, is that you have an opportunity to step up. What crisis does, it creates opportunity. Crisis creates opportunity for people to be answers to problems. And this won't be the last time that we have a situation where people are in are, are need. We're seeing this around the world where there's situations that are happening right now. And I'll talk a little bit more about it later. But the situations that are happening right now where folks are, are needing help and assistance right now. You know, just a few weeks ago, I was listening to a podcast and, and even saw this on the news, how there was flooding that literally ravaged Pakistan. There, there, there were grasslands and parts of that country that were overran by water. And then 
equally so that's happening in uh, uh, Southeast Asia, or excuse me, Southern Asia, and consequently over in Northern Africa, they're dealing with droughts. And all these things are happening as a result of water. All these things are happening as a result of, of the movement of water. We're talking about here in Jackson, but this is a global issue where water has become either a nuisance or a source. And the thing about stepping up is, is we have to figure out how can we become a source and not a nuisance? How can we become a part of, of, of changing narratives, of changing what people believe about a particular situation, about changing what, what, what it takes to, to get involved in service? Because I can tell you in my line of work, folk have started approaching us. We literally, literally, uh, I had several organizations come to me, even students from the University of Alabama reached out to me and said, hey, could we come and serve uh, the city of Jackson during this water crisis? There was a company in Nashville that reached out to me and said, hey, can we bring water down and serve people in your communities? Crisis tends to activate people to action. And we've seen it more and more now that people have to be consistently active about participating in the answers for their community. And you and I can do that. We have a chance to do that. You may have an idea or, or an innovative uh, solution that could really be the answer to a problem in a community. But are you going to be courageous? It takes courage to do things that are unprecedented. It takes courage to do things that aren't conventional. It takes courage to be about that action, basically. It takes courage. But what are you going to get in your mind and say, hey, man, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do what I need to do. I'm, I'm going to step up to the plate. I'm going to take some, some, some action. There's some local activists and organizations here in Jackson, like the uh, Cooperative Jackson and young activists like Maisie Brown and, and other folks who, are, who have used their platforms and used their influence to try to cause people to engage in a a long-term or, or engage in a, in a robust conversation about this issue. Yeah, we're talking about water. Like I said, we're talking about water and I'm giving you some answers and give you some solutions or giving you some perspective about what the issue is. But I'm saying that in this, we cannot, we cannot be lazy in our approach to this. We gotta be willing to keep stepping in. We gotta keep willing to engage because your engagement is going to be the answer. Your willingness to say, hey, let's let's figure this out. What 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 are the answers? Where is the answer? Who should we have a conversation with? What engineers do we need to call? What what organizations do we need to call? What what nonprofit is engaged in this? What what can I do? What can I do to participate in this answer? And I think that's important. And lastly, as I'm going to get you out of here, lastly, the long game must be in view. Let's be very clear about something. This is not going to be the last time we have a situation like this. We have to be honest and talk about the long game. The issue of our time is climate change. Now, let, let's be very clear about something. I know that there are going to be people that watch this or listen to this and they're going to be like, well, Lee, I don't necessarily have any views or perspective about this. And it's fine. I understand that. It is, this is not for that purpose, but I want you to understand if you really look at what's happening in the world, climate has been the an existential crisis. It is the reason why we see migration happening so much on a, at a at a uh, at a astronomical scale. Now, now this is beyond talking about war, right? Because wars are causing folks to have to migrate and move. Okay, that's 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 a huge issue. But beyond that, there are going to there has been climate migration, or excuse me, there has been uh, migration due to climate, and there's going to be more migration due to climate. If you look at su southern uh, the southern hemisphere, there has been so many tsunamis, tsunamis, floods. There have been there have been moments of, of ridiculous droughts. There are parts here, even here in America, where there have been crazy droughts. There have been inclement weather in places that you would never assume there will be. Places in our country have had more hurricanes than ever before. Places in our country have had more wildfires than ever before. And, and this is an issue. This is a pervasive issue. But I'm very hopeful. 
Because I truly believe that in the long-term view, we as a generation, we as a people will participate in the answer. Now, you know, it, it takes people having the courage, as I said earlier. It takes people being bold enough. But, you know, it also takes people cautiously and thoughtfully looking at the situation and saying, you know what? It's happened before, but it does not have to happen again. I may not be able to control the weather, but I can I can control whether or not people are displaced. I can do everything in my power and do everything in my strategy or my strategy or plan to ensure that when this happens, we're going to be okay. One of my favorite stories and favorite life examples, there was this example of this gentleman who was a leader in his country. And the guy who was over him came to him and said, hey, wh- what, what, how, how can we come up with a strategy? And for seven years, he said, hey, listen, in seven years, we know that there is going to be a famine. There's going to be something that happens that we're not ready for. So let's, let's conserve about 25%, roughly 20 to 25% of what we grow over these seven years. Because we believe, or we know that there's going to be an issue, there's going to be something that happens. There's going to be something that's unprecedented. And because of this strategy, his country was able to sustain, not only sustain, but became an economic boon place in the world because they had what they needed in the time where folks needed it the most. What's the answer for you? is that you can actually be the answer to a problem in that way if you prepare yourself for it. We're seeing this happen right now with the with uh, Ukraine right now. Ukraine is one of the biggest wheat producers in the world. And much of Western, Af- excuse me, Eastern Africa gets their wheat and grain from Ukraine. Literally the supply chain has been disrupted because of what's happening in one country a war that is happening in one part of the world. And it's wild because it's showing us that if we figure out how to create sources where we don't only depend on one group of people or one uh, 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 entity, we can actually save ourselves a lot of pain and a lot of struggle. It doesn't mean that we don't work to fix that problem doesn't mean that we don't do whatever we can to ensure that that's not reoccurring. But our strategy suggests that this is triggered because this is happening. What am I saying to you? We got to think about it. We got to be about preparedness. Because preparedness is the key to sustain in any storm. You only are as successful as as prepared you are, if that even makes any sense. The more prepared you are, the more successful you'll be. Success just doesn't, just doesn't happen. You have to prepare for it. You do. You have to prepare for success. Let me tell you the one the reason why Tom Brady is probably literally like the great, the reason why he's the greatest quarterback of all time is because he's extremely prepared. I talked about this a few months ago, how I watched, watched uh, some documentary a documentary about him, but that man is prepared. He works hard. Kobe Bryant was the same way. They prepared. They worked hard. They put in the time. And I'm not saying you have to do what they do specifically, but you have to become so driven to get something done that you have to become very, very a a, a, a focus, like singular-minded in some ways. Because the only way that you can overcome circumstances that are there and and obstacles that are going to be set in front of you is having the ability and the capacity to recognize, hey, you can try to stop me, but you're not going to. 
because I'm prepared. I knew you were going to throw, I knew you were going to do something that was unnecessary. I knew it. I was prepared. I was ready for it. And this is why this is important. Of all these things that we're talking about today, I truly believe it can be done. I, I, I'm saying this because I believe this with all my heart. I believe Jackson is stepping to his greatest days. The state of Mississippi is going to step into his greatest days. There may be people that watch this or listen to this and they say, well, you know, based on reports, based on what we've seen in the news, based on all these different things, you know, it's, you know, it's Mississippi being Mississippi. It's Jackson being Jackson. And the hilarious part about that is, sure, that partially might be true. But I do believe the greatest days for our state and our city are coming because of individuals having the audacity to, first of all, be innovative, having the audacity to collaborate, having the audacity to step up to the plate and be playing it for the long game. The long game is where it's at. You can make a difference in the world if you actually are willing to be innovative, be creative. If you're actually willing to be thoughtful and do some things that are different and collaborate with folks that is, might be unusual for you to engage with. It, it, it may be that you need to step up and say, you know what, I'm not going to be about my four and no more. I'm going to do everything I can to ensure that anybody that comes in contact with me are going to be beneficiaries of the work that I've done. And like, you can do that. And you got to be thinking about legacy. What is going to happen in the long term as a result of the commitment that I've made? What have I given myself to that, that's going to ensure that the future is changed? Because you and I can make that difference. You and I can be the answers to the problems in our world. And I believe that's going to happen in the city of Jackson. And I believe it's going to happen wherever you are in the country, in our country, and in our world. Much love. And I'll see you next time here on Leading with Lee. Thank you for watching and or listening to this week's episode of Leading with Lee. If you have not done it yet, subscribe on YouTube and all podcasting platforms. If you want to get more information and connect with me, visit me at www.leascott.com or follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Lee A. Scott II or Lee A. Scott II. So thank you for watching. Much love and let's get started.